Why I'm rooting for the 1972 landslide I once feared. I want a Trump win so big it sends a message to the ruling class that we are mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. For podcast listeners, a picture of the United States blanketed in red with one state and Washington, D.C. voting blue. I'm not supposed to be rooting for Trump and MAGA. I'm supposed to be one of the million and change who huddles on my couch in terror, watching MSNBC as the results from Iowa trickle in. I'm supposed to somberly nod when Rachel Maddow tells her viewers they won't show Trump's speech. Shut down the speech, I'm supposed to say, as if any of this is normal. I will not watch it. I will not listen for myself and think for myself and judge for myself. I will instead fill my head with what Lawrence O'Donnell, Joy Reid, and the queen of media, the multi-million dollar baby, Maddow herself, tells me. Yes, turn it off, says Bette Midler. Yes, please, moans Barbara Streisand. It's the right thing to do, says Rob Reiner, to save democracy. Uh, yeah. Speaking of the establishment not being at ease, we'd be remiss not to mention a really interesting uh, media story aspect of the results last night. Um, both on MSNBC and uh, on uh, CNN, there were cutaways from the uh, acceptance speeches of both Trump and Ramaswamy. Here we have a clip first of Rachel Maddow's response to uh, Trump's win and uh, her rationalization as to why they were not going to play Trump's acceptance remarks. Interject. Sorry. I'm sorry, I just have to do a little bit no. of business just for a second. Um, at this point in the evening, the projected winner of the Iowa caucuses um, has just started giving his victory speech. Uh, we will keep an eye on that as it happens. Uh, we will let you know if there's any news made in that speech, if there's anything noteworthy, something substantive and important. Um, the reason I'm saying this is Of course, there is a reason that we and other news organizations have generally stopped giving an unfiltered live platform to remarks by former President Trump. It is not out of spite. It is not a decision that we relish. It is a decision that we regularly revisit. Um, And honestly, earnestly, it is not an easy decision. But there is a cost to us as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things. That is a fundamental truth of our business and who we are. And so his remarks tonight will not air here live. We will monitor them um, and let you know about any news that he makes. All right. So that happened also over on a Jake Tapper show. Look, this, the, and many people like Glenn Greenwald pointed out there is this re- interesting gap between claims that we have to preserve democracy and then kind of doing things like this that don't exactly scream democracy, picking or choosing um, whether or not you're going to air an acceptance speech. I can maybe understand it with Vivek Ramaswamy, who's a, maybe a less significant candidate, but the former president of the United States having a major win in a caucus like this and then refusing on the basis of your editorial judgment not to play this, when, of course, Rachel Maddow was behind so much misinformation in the Russiagate era, did strike people as uh, a bit yeah. hypocritical. It's obviously horrible. It also um, has, like, it, you know, it's starting to have an effect. We haven't heard as much from Trump lately. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I genuinely don't know what Trump would do differently on Ukraine and sure. Israel and some other pressing issues that have come up. Um, now, part of that is him not being very specific about what his plans are, but also we just we don't hear from him. Here was an opportunity where we were going to actually hear him say things. And what they're they're afraid. Yeah. What are they afraid? They're afraid that if people hear from Donald Trump, they're going to like him more. Republicans <laughs> in Iowa can't like him any more than they already do. I mean, this it, it's yeah. not it's not working. The idea that we can sh- protect you from the hurtful things Trump says, and that's a strategy for delegitimizing him and preventing him from becoming president, that could not have be backfired. It's backfiring in real time as we're watching it. Please let us hear from Trump so we can decide, um, we, we can hear what his policy proposals or lack thereof is. But if you don't show us, you're, you're, you're not ultimately trusting the people with that decision. And I, tactically, I don't think shielding the people from that decision is working at all. There's no evidence that it's turning people off of Trump. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it's causing them to forget what they disliked about Trump in the first place. I, I think that's a strong point. Democracy dies in darkness after all. Stick around. We're right. This is a difficult decision, Maddow told her viewers to justify censoring Trump's speech. Somewhere deep inside, this must humiliate the journalist she once was. On some level, 
She knows this is as bad as what Vladimir Putin does in Russia to protect his people from bad news. Saving democracy includes censorship, in case you didn't know, along with throwing your political opponents in jail and removing them from the ballot, not to mention persecuting political protesters for thought crimes and using the legacy media as your own personal propaganda delivery device. Are we sure this is in Putin's Russia? Is this really where we've arrived as a country, as a people, as the once mighty left? Yes, there is no point in pretending otherwise. We watched the whole game play out this past week as they twisted what Trump said yet again about poisoning the blood of our nation. They decide what his words mean. Replacing illegal immigrants with immigrants makes it racist. So here is yet more proof of the person you need to fear. CBS poll, of their final poll before the Iowa caucus, this is a national poll, shows that 81% of Republican primary voters and caucus participants, 81% of those people agree with Donald Trump that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country. That means that 81% of the Republican primary electorate believe Nikki Haley has poisoned blood and is poisoning the blood of the United States. Oh, the lies they tell. They can't see what they've become. By now, Trump could be dragged through the village and hanged, and all of them would cheer. His supporters could be put into tainment camps, and they would all go along with it. In the run-up to 2020, I was in a panic that we were about to live through another 1972. I did everything possible to ensure Biden was the nominee, because I knew he could beat Trump. But now, bring it on, I say. Let's have the full landslide victory, the total beatdown. They deserve it. Democrats deserve to lose, and to lose so big, it sends an unequivocal message that resonates through the ages, never again. Never again can it happen in this country that the sitting president investigates a duly elected president before he takes office. It can never happen again when one regime declares itself the supreme leader and decides to systematically undo the election results by sabotaging the campaign and the presidency of their chief rival. That choice is not up to them. It's up to us. It can never happen again that the regime drives an impeachment aided by the security state that sends out operatives within the administration to find something to use against Trump and openly sabotage him when his job is to serve us, the American people. And that, out of bitterness, narcissism, and totalitarian impulses, a regime that demands all of American society form a phony resistance and use that to justify the dehumanization, marginalization, surveillance, and disenfranchisement of American citizens. It can never happen again that the well-funded cabal of elites form a pact with politicians, billionaires, the media, and the security state to rig the election. That is the exact kind of monopolistic abuse of power Teddy Roosevelt once sought to dismantle. It can never happen again that an election is won long before Election Day because the regime decided to change laws to allow them to collect ballots in an operation funded with dark money by billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, a decision made without the permission of the American people and hidden from them by a lying, complicit media. It can never happen again that lawyers like Michael Teeter and the 65 Project are allowed to threaten and harass lawyers who might choose to represent or defend Trump or people who worked for him. They don't get to convict Trump of imaginary crimes in the court of public opinion to justify their authoritarian overreach. It can never happen again that political protesters are treated like terrorists in their own country, put on trial for spectral evidence, what they believe rather than what they did. It can never happen again that protests themselves are turned into threats against the regime, not in America. Protests are the voice of the people, and it's the government's job to shut up and listen, 
not to tell them to shut up, throw them in jail, and turn them into enemies of the state. It can never happen again that a former president and his administration weaponized the DOJ to persecute and jail a political opponent. The four indictments, the two impeachments, the phony show trial, who elected Liz Cheney to be the leader of anything, let alone the decision to convict Trump in the court of public opinion without defense of counsel or due process. Shut up and sit down, ma'am. I don't care who your father is. This is not a monarchy. It is your job to listen to us. The ongoing lies told by the press about Trump are beyond the scope of one regime's power as granted to them by the people of the United States. If they are to be state propaganda, then let them be identified as such. The regime doesn't get to tell the American people what they should care about. They don't get to decide what kind of country this should be for us. And they certainly do not have the right, nor the invitation, to go to war on our elected leaders just because they don't like them. Come November, the silent majority must find their way back to 1972. If our leaders can't bring this country together, then we the people must. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. To Democrats, the memory of 1972 remains an enduring nightmare. Nixon won every state but Massachusetts. Watergate handed the Democrats one more chance in 1976 to address the needs of the people. They failed, still trying to sell their utopia. By 1980, it was a changed country. So many wandered around aimlessly, joining cults, tuning out, going to California to find themselves, only to eventually sell out, abandon the hippie life, and embrace the greed-is-good lifestyle of the 1980s. A tweet by Walter Kern, quote, Expect change. Nothing moves in one direction forever. The moon doesn't just grow fuller and fuller until it fills the sky. Turn, 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 as the birds sang. How did hippies become yuppies? Nostradamus over and out, end quote. Heading into the 2020 election, many of us were warning about another 1972, a pull too far to the left. Don't pick Bernie, we said. Don't pick Elizabeth Warren. Don't rock the boat. Trump had shaken things up in 2016, and now we needed someone to calm things down. By May, violent protests broke out on the streets. All of our best laid plans were destroyed as COVID lockdowns ended, and protesters were burning buildings, looting, and assaulting police officers. It was beginning to look a lot like 1972. As I was frantically urging my fellow Democrats to do something, or risk Trump winning in a landslide, I slowly began to realize that there was never any intention of telling the public the truth. Their narrative was going to be that the police were racists, that Donald Trump was the racist in chief, and that if we didn't vote him out, this would be our new normal. The media and the politicians were going to gaslight Americans, lie directly to our faces at the Democratic National Convention that these were mostly peaceful protests. If there was violence, it was justified because Trump was just that evil. What a fool I was. I was like Jake at the end of Chinatown, who spends the whole movie trying to rescue Faye Dunaway, only to lead her to her own demise. You want to do your partner a big favor? Take him home. Take him home! Just get him the hell out of here! Go home, Jake. I'm doing you a favor. Come on, Jake. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. That was the beginning of the end for me. Once I saw the puppet masters, I couldn't stop seeing the strings. They were on their way to rigging the 2020 election, and nothing was going to stop them. Certainly not violent riots on the streets of America. What riots? By the end of the election, I realized that there was never any intention of Biden and Harris winning over the hearts and minds of the people on any mandate. They were going to coast on the fumes of the Obama presidency and let the system win the election for them. 
I realized I'd wasted time I didn't have advocating for a candidate the system would install and pretend everyone voted for. They didn't. They voted against Trump without giving Trump time to change their minds, which is what elections are supposed to be about. Biden took the protests as a clarion call to guide his presidency, but that is not what the people voted for, not even close. They changed America almost overnight without even asking us. He was a Trojan horse like George Spawn, who opened the door and allowed the Manson family to take over Spawn Ranch. <laughs> hey, does George Spawn still own this ranch? Yeah, George still owns it. Does he still live here? Yeah. Does he still live right there? Yeah. Is he here now? I guess so. So George gave you all permission to be here? Of course he did. And you all take care of him? Well, we take care of George. We love George. Well, is there anything wrong with me saying hello to an old friend? You can't see him right now. Why can't I see him right now? Because he's napping. This is his nap time. Well, I think I'll just go see for myself. You never know. You might have just woke up. I kept waiting for the day when the madness would stop. The bubble of fear and hysteria would burst, and things could return to normal. They've brought nothing but division, nothing but chaos. They've foisted upon us a cult-like religion none of us asked for. Now we're being forced to accept that there is nothing immoral about mutilating the bodies of children, sterilizing them, all in the name of utopia. They care more about the migrants they've invited to flood our borders than the people in the cities and towns who can't accommodate them. Let them eat cake, they might as well say. And if you care about any of it, you're a racist and a bigot who hates all immigrants. Biden and the Democrats have had almost four years to prove to the American people that they were the better option, but they failed. They failed to unite the country. They failed to defend democracy. They failed to revive the economy. They failed to calm things down. It's long past time for Trump to arrive on election night with just two words, short and sweet. You're fired. 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 Let's go. Hello, Mr. Trump. It's an, honor, it's an honor to meet you. I was wondering what you would say to President Obama. You're fired. Now Breaking away. I'm rooting for Trump and MAGA as I rooted for the cutters in Breaking Away the kind of movie Hollywood would never make today. Why wouldn't they? Because they don't care about people like those who inhabit this film. For one thing, they're white. For another, they live in a red state and would be MAGA. At least some of them would be. What a great story that would be, four friends divided over politics. You know, I used to think I was a really great quarterback in high school. Still think so, too. I can't even bring myself to light a cigarette because I keep thinking I gotta stay in shape. You know what really gets me, though? I mean, here I am, I gotta live in this stinking town, and I gotta read in the newspapers about some hotshot kid, new star of the college team. Every year is gonna be a new one. Every year is never going to be me. I'm just going to be Mike. 20-year-old Mike. 30-year-old Mike. Oh, mean old man, Mike. These college kids out here, they're never going to get old. They're out of shape. Because new ones come along every year. 
gonna keep calling us cutters. For them is just a dirty word. For me is just something else I never got a chance to be. But that isn't what Breaking Away is about. It's about four friends who live in a college town in Indiana, whose life paths feel hopeless. They're stuck with minimum wage jobs to maybe get married and live the lives their parents did. They're called cutters because the main income in the town was the rock quarry. I cut the stone for this building. You did? Yeah. I was one fine stone cutter. Mike's dad, Moochers, Cyril's, all of us. Well, Cyril's dad. <laughs> Never mind. Thing of it was, I loved it. I was young and slim and strong. I was damn proud of my work. And the buildings went up. When they were finished, the damnedest thing happened. It was like buildings is too good for us. Nobody told us that. Just, just felt uncomfortable, that's all. Even now, I, I'd like to be able to stroll through the campus and look at the limestone, but I just feel out of place. You guys still go swimming in the quarries? Sure. So the only thing you got to show for my 20 years of work is the holes we left behind. I don't mind. I do. Cyril's dad says he took that college exam. We both took it. How did both of us do? Well, I don't know. One of us did OK. But neither of us. Hell, I don't want to go to college, Dad. To hell with them. I'm proud of being a cutter. You're not a cutter. I'm a cutter. All four of them have dreams that will likely go unfulfilled. But lucky for us, the filmmaker has our best interests in mind. By the end of the movie, the four of them have entered a bicycle race against the college kids. With a crummy bike, shabby clothes, and run-down shoes, they take on the race. The odds are against them in every way imaginable. From the only good racer getting injured to the others not being able to ride very well, they're fish out of water in their t-shirts that say cutters on them. Despite it all, they don't stop. They push forward through the pain, through the hopelessness, through the humiliation. And by some miracle, they pull out a surprise win. By the end of this movie, there was not a dry eye in the house. Movies used to do this for us. They used to transport us from our ordinary lives to experience the extraordinary. When I felt so much despair by the end of 2020, I began watching MAGA rallies, getting to know the people I'd been told were racists and monsters. But even after everything had been taken from them, their culture, government, status, and jobs, they were happier than anyone I'd seen in a year. We had everything, and we were miserable. They had almost nothing, and they were having the best time, whether it was freezing or raining. Tell me, have you ever seen a political speech like this? And we are a nation that no longer has a free and fair press. Fake news is all you get. And we are a nation that loves to be rained upon. Let's stay out here and go. Let's stay out here, right? I'm not leaving.
We're a brave nation. We are a nation where free speech is no longer allowed, where crime is rampant and out of control like never before, and where more people died of COVID in 2021 than in 2020. And we are a nation that is allowing Iran to build a massive nuclear weapon in China to use the trillions of dollars it has taken from us to build a military to rival our own. And just two years ago, we had Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea in China. They kept showing up because the one thing they had that couldn't be taken away was Trump. He was never going to turn his back on them, and they were never going to turn their backs on him. Tucker Carlson had it exactly right in his now famous monologue about Trump and MAGA. Listen to it carefully, because that's the story. You head inland from the coasts. It's a former industrial town. They made Pullman rail cars there for many years. But it's been losing population for decades. There's still a lot of nice people in Butler. For 60 grand, you can buy a decent house there. It's a place you might be happy in. But our professional class is not impressed by Butler. They don't consider Butler, Pennsylvania, or places like it, the future. To them, places like Butler are embarrassing relics of a past best forgotten. The men of Butler may have built this country, and they did, but they mean nothing to our leaders now. You can be certain of that because when large numbers of people in Butler started killing themselves with narcotics, no one in Washington or New York or Los Angeles said a word about it. And so it continued. There have now been so many opioid deaths in Butler that a few years ago, residents built an overdose memorial in the middle of town. MSNBC didn't cover that. So given all of that, it was interesting how the people around Butler feel about Donald Trump. Here are the pictures of the president's rally there on Saturday night. Tens of thousands of people came. So many people that the crowd obscured the horizon. It looked like a visit from the Pope. When was the last time a political speech drew that many people? Well, the media didn't ask. Instead, they attacked the rally as a super spreader event. Trump endangers thousands in Pennsylvania. Okay, we'll leave the epidemiology to CNN. But the question still hung in the air. Why did all those people come? Why? They must have known that Donald Trump is the most evil man who's ever lived. They've heard that every day for five years. They know that people who support Donald Trump are also evil. They're bigots, they're morons, they're racist cult members. They know that Americans have been fired from their jobs for supporting Donald Trump. Not to mention kicked off social media, belittled by their kids' teachers, shunned by decent society. Only losers and freaks support Donald Trump. People in Butler knew all of that. But on Saturday, they went to the Donald Trump rally anyway. Why exactly did they do that? We should be pondering that question deeply as we watch tomorrow's returns and as we live through the aftermath of them. Millions of Americans sincerely love Donald Trump. They love him in spite of everything they've heard. They love him often in spite of himself. They're not deluded. They know exactly who Trump is. They love him anyway. They love Donald Trump because no one else loves them. The country they built the country their ancestors fought for over hundreds of years has left them to die in their unfashionable little towns, mocked and despised by the sneering halfwits with finance degrees but no actual skills who seem to run everything all of a sudden. Whatever Donald Trump's faults, he is better than the rest of the people in charge. At least he doesn't hate them for their weakness. Donald Trump, in other words, is and has always been a living indictment of the people who run this country. That was true four years ago, when Trump came out of nowhere to win the presidency, and it's every bit as true right now. It may be even more true than it's ever been, and it will remain true, regardless of whether Donald Trump wins re-election. Trump rose because they failed. It's as simple as that. If the people in charge had done a halfway decent job with the country they inherited, if they'd cared about anything other than themselves, even for just a moment, Donald Trump would still be hosting Celebrity Apprentice. But they didn't. Instead, they were incompetent and narcissistic and cruel and relentlessly dishonest. They wrecked what they didn't build. They lied about it. They hurt anyone who told the truth about what they were doing. That's true. We watched. 
America is still a great country, the best in the world, but our ruling class is disgusting. A vote for Trump is a vote against them. That's what's going on in that picture. That's what's going on in this country. Watching the richest and most powerful people in the country demonize and dehumanize people who have no power makes me sick. They can't tell stories like breaking away because they don't know the country anymore. They have decided to turn people they no longer understand into their enemies. Without even knowing it, the Democrats and the ruling class have inadvertently cast themselves as the villains in this story, in their ignorance and stupidity, in trying to cling to what was instead of allowing an ever-evolving country to turn the page. They're missing one of the greatest underdog stories in the history of America. I don't know about you, but I'm rooting for the happy ending. When the underdogs prevail and win in a landslide. Go, MAGA, go. Thank you for listening to my podcast, sajastone.substack.com. And I'm thinking of changing the name of my site. Free thinking through the fourth turning seems a bit long. So maybe if you have any ideas, let me know. And remember, to thine own self, be true.
Well, maybe the landslide will bring it down. Well, well, the landslide will bring it down. Thank you.